Hi everybody. This is one of the short units which introduces you to some of the basic aspects of plant morphology, which are particularly relevant in propagation. In this unit, we're going to be focusing on external aspects of leaves. One of the many ways in which we can classify plants is by the lifespan of their leaves. And we can describe plants as being evergreen or deciduous. Evergreen means they have leaves year round, although the leaves are in a constant cycle of renewal, so a plant doesn't have the same leaves for the whole of its life. Think of our iconic native tree, the coast redwood, Sequoia sempervirens. It's evergreen, but if you have one on your property, you'll know that it's constantly shedding leaves. Evergreen trees and shrubs can be further divided into broadleaf evergreens and narrowleaf evergreens. Broadleaf evergreens include trees such as the European olive, southern magnolia and coast live oak. Narrowleaf evergreens refers to conifers with their narrow, often needle-like leaves and includes plants such as pines, redwoods, firs, cypress and junipers. In contrast to evergreens, deciduous plants usually drop all their leaves at one particular time of year as an adaptation to environmental stress. This might be the cold of winter, in which case plants are described as being winter deciduous, or the stress might be the heat and drought of summer, in which case plants are summer deciduous. Some plants just drop some of their leaves in response to environmental stress, and we can refer to them as semi deciduous. Two examples are the California native gray sage Salvia leucophylla and the European native. Jerusalem sage, Flomus fruticosa. Let's take a look now at some of the leaf parts. The flat expanded part of angiosperm leaves is called the leaf blade or lamina. The top side of the leaf blade is referred to as the upper leaf blade or the adaxial side, and the bottom side is referred to as the lower leaf blade or the abaxial side. A leaf may be attached to the shoot by a small stem called a petiole. Not all species have a petiole though, and the leaf may be attached directly to the stem. Leaves without a petiole are described as sessile or sessile. And examples include Salvia sessilifolia and Pajaro manzanita, Arctostaphylus pajaroensis. Although sometimes Pajaro Manzanita has a very, very short petiole. In the picture on the right, you can see part of a stem from an apple tree. And this will look familiar if you've already done the lecture on stems. The section of stem in the photo has several nodes. And nodes are the areas of a stem where, depending on the leaf arrangement, one or more leaves are attached. In the angle between the stem and the leaf, you'll find an axillary bud. And there's one hiding here, 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 and here as well. The axillary bud may grow into a, a vegetative lateral shoot, or it may grow into a reproductive stem with flowers on it. In propagation, when we're preparing stem cuttings, we usually make the basal cut just below a node, and we may or may not cut off the axillary bud at the base of this node. The top cut of a stem cutting is usually made just above a node. Leaves are arranged along the shoots in various patterns, and this is referred to as phyllotaxy, or more simply, the leaf arrangement. This isn't hugely important in propagation, but it is an important identification characteristic of plants. A leaf arrangement where a single leaf is attached at each node is called alternate. When there's a single leaf attached on one side of the stem and a second leaf exactly opposite it at the same level on the stem, the leaf arrangement is called opposite. Nodes which have three or more leaves attached in a circle 
around the stem are described as being whorled. And plants that have two or more leaves attached at the same node are described as having a bundled or fascicled leaf arrangement. And a good example of this is one of our California native buckwheats, Eriogonum fasciculatum. Most pine trees also have the needles arranged in bundles or fascicles. Some plants have leaf-like or scale-like structures growing immediately below the point of attachment of a petiole or leaf. These are called stipules and they're usually green. The presence or absence of stipules isn't important in propagation, but again can be important in plant identification. Stipules are very common in plants in the rose family, such as roses, apples and pears. And it's thought that the function of stipules is to protect the shoot's apical meristem when it's small and young. Bracts are leaf-like structures that are usually associated with flowers. They may be brightly coloured and often add to the ornamental appeal of many plants such as bougainvillea and many of the leucodendrons and proteas. It's thought that the function of bracts is to help protect the flowers when they're developing. Bracts are usually located immediately below an inflorescence, but in the case of Spanish and French lavender, they're located at the top of the inflorescence and give the flower spikes of these two plants their distinctive butterfly wings or bunny ears. Some plants have modified leaves and stem structures. There are climbing plants which have tendrils which are modified leaves that enable these plants to cling to other plants in the wild or to structures such as fences or arbors in cultivated landscapes. Examples include edible peas, sweet peas and the passion flower that you can see in the photo. In vegetative propagation we may need to remove the tendrils near the base of cuttings. And tendrils can be a pain in propagation because if you're not careful you can end up with a tray of young plants that all have their tendrils wrapped around each other and it's really hard to separate them when it's time to transplant them. Some plants have leaf-like structures that are actually flattened stem tissue that's photosynthetic and these structures are called phyllodes or cladodes or cladodes and are particularly common in the acacia genus of Australian shrubs and trees. Let's look at armatures now. Some plants have armatures in the form of thorns, spines and prickles. And these terms are often used wrongly in everyday speech. Technically, thorns are modified stem tissue and contain vascular tissue. An example of a plant with thorns is pyracantha, which you may notice in the fall because it produces clusters of vibrant red or orange berries. Don't confuse it with Cotoneaster though, or our native Toyon, which also produce vibrant red berries in the fall. Cacti, like the one in the photo here, have spines, which are modified leaves or stipules. And like thorns, they also contain vascular tissue. Prickles are just a sharp outgrowth of epidermal tissue. They don't contain any vascular tissue and they can be found on stems, leaves and sometimes on flowers. Prickles can often be broken cleanly off the stem. The main relevance of armatures in propagation is that it makes these plants a real pain, literally, to work with and you may need a pair of thick gloves. Large thorns and prickles may need to be cut off at the base of cuttings in order to stick these cuttings easily. Other structures you may notice on leaves and stems are hairs, bristles or glands. Collectively, these are referred to as trichomes and they're mentioned again in the unit on the interior structures of leaves. The presence of hairs on a leaf blade is usually an adaptation to heat and drought and helps reduce water loss in hot, dry environments. Hairs and bristles may also protect a plant from leaf-eating pests. In propagation, hairy leaves can be a problem because the hairs trap water, and this makes cuttings, divisions, and 
young plants more vulnerable to diseases which proliferate in warm, moist environments, such as powdery mildew and botrytis. You'll hear more about these diseases in the unit on nursery hygiene. When you're propagating plants with hairy leaves, such as the lamb's ear in the photo, you may need to provide a propagation environment that's less humid to reduce the risk of leaf rot and diseases. Hairs may also make it more difficult to use pesticides effectively, as the chemical may not pe thoroughly penetrate through the layer of hairs. Leaves contain vascular tissue, xylem and phloem, and in angiosperms this is visible on the leaf surface as veins. In general, the leaf veins are widest at the leaf base and then become narrower as they extend towards the leaf margins. The pattern of leaf venation differs between species and is used as an identification and classification character characteristic of plants. Most angiosperm leaves have a midrib, which is an extension of the petiole, and smaller veins then branch off this. Recognising the leaf veins can be important when you're doing leaf cuttings of plants like Rex begonias and Streptocarpus. Leaf shape and size varies widely between species, from small needle-like leaves to the large palmate leaves of plants like Fatsia japonica, which can be almost a foot wide. Leaf shape and size are important characteristics for identifying plants. From a propagation point of view, remember that the larger the surface area of the leaves, the faster plants are more likely to lose water through transpiration. When you're propagating plants from cuttings, you may want to consider reducing the size of leaves by cutting them in half or perhaps even smaller. And this will help limit the amount of water lost from transpiration. It also means from a practical point of view that you can use your space much more effectively because you can fit more cuttings into a given area. In the photo, you can see stem cuttings of a pomegranate cultivar that have had some of their larger leaves cut in half. And finally, let's talk a little bit about leaf colour. Most leaves appear green to us humans because of the pigment chlorophyll in the leaf cells. Chlorophyll plays an important role in plant growth because it absorbs light for photosynthesis. Chlorophyll is a good absorber of light in the red and blue wavelengths, but it's a poor absorber of light in the green wavelength. Consequently, much of the green light is reflected by the leaf surface, and that's why we humans see leaves as green. The leaves of some plants have chlorophyll missing from some cells, or there are other pink or yellow pigments visible to us humans. These bicolored or multicolored leaves are described as being variegated. The variegation may have a regular pattern, such as the bold, bright green and yellow vertical stripes of the variegated century plant, or the pattern may be more irregular, like the Diamond Heights cultivar of Carmel Creeper Ceanothus, which you can see here on the right, or the Spider's Web cultivar of Fatsia japonica here at the bottom. Causes of variegation include chimeras, transposons, pattern genes, virus infection, and environmental stress, and we'll discuss these in a later module. From a horticultural point of view, variegation can be a good thing because it can be a source of new cultivars. From a propagation point of view, variegation is usually a trait that doesn't come true from seed, and therefore most variegated plants have to be propagated vegetatively from cuttings, divisions or tissue culture. That's the end of this unit on leaves and here's a very corny but seasonal joke to send you back to canvas with. <laughs>